Uh, I don't think Charlotte is guilty. She's a humble maid, working for her bread, doing the decent thing to care for her family. Every bit of your argument is constructed from guesses and conjectures. I don't believe your story is any more than a dark fairy tale that you cooked up in your mind. Huh. <laughs> well, we'll just have to wait and see, won't we? I suppose we will. Now I'm afraid it's my turn to say my little piece. I believe I have the correct answer to this mystery of ours. After hearing what Charlotta had to say a bit ago, I've been doing some thinking, and I have to admit I see some logic in what she said. When Lord Montague, or Monty, as his relatives called him, passed away, Helena automatically inherited all of her father's wealth. However, what if Helena was to die? Who would inherit after her? Why, the next closest living relative, of course. As we all know, that's Lord Dian Lady Diana Strawberry. Come back here a second, Lady Strawberry. I'm not quite finished with you yet. Oh, Sir Grayson, not you too. For Charlotta, now you. I'm sorry, my dear lady, but I must speak my mind. As much as I hate to slander the reputation of such a dear lady as yourself, I'm afraid that it must be said. The most likely culprit would be you, Lady Diana, as you are the next in line to inherit the Montague fortune. I am surprised by this allegation, honestly. Helena's death came as such a shock to me I hadn't realized I might be next in line for the Montague fortune. I decided to throw a fit, deny adamantly, explain calmly. I'm going to deny it. Lord Grayson Dorian, I'm surprised at you. There's no way I could have done such a thing to my own cousin. Not even for all the money in the world. I may be an orphan. I may have very little money to my name. I may even have to work for my keep, but I will tell you one thing that I am not. I am not a killer. Helena may have died by the hand of someone in this house tonight, but it certainly wasn't me. I am sorry to have so offended you, lady. At this point, we must hold nothing back. If we are ever to find Helena's killer, we must explore every avenue. Look into every possible theory. Yes, I suppose you're right. But please excuse me a moment. This has got me quite worked up. Chapter 3, Digging Deeper I slipped away for a bit of quiet thinking. Helena was dead, and I seemed to be everyone's prime suspect. I knew that I needed to find some way to prove my innocence. My first thought was to go back to the scene of the crime. NOT BY YOURSELF! No, 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 no. Terrible, terrible idea. Do not do this by yourself. She's doing it by herself, isn't she? Oh my gosh. I know they say the culprit always goes back to the scene of the crime, but in this case, I was determined to find something that incriminated a true murderer. Yet I hesitated at Helena's door, candle in hand, unsure if I wanted to re-enter that dark room. My skin felt creepy crawly just at the thought of being in the same room with a dead body, even of a beloved relative. There's my red candle again. When I finally worked out the gumption to go into the bedroom, I stood for a few minutes, not sure what I was looking for, but then I saw it on the floor by her bed. I stooped to pick up the object and examine it, a small, flower-shaped bead. I felt like I'd seen something like it before, but I wasn't sure where. I looked around Helena's dressing table to see if any of her necklaces were missing a bead, but nothing looked out of place. Still unsure of how this bead could help me, I, I put it in my pocket, just in case it would come in handy later, but I could no longer stand being in a lone room with Helena's lifeless form. So quickly I left the room. Still qu not quite ready to rejoin the others in the dining room, I decided to think by myself. Go somewhere, somewhere where there weren't any dead bodies lying about. I felt myself drawn to the library. The large, beautiful library that I always loved as a child. There were so many memories here, just so many. Rainy days had been spent in that room, whiling away the hours with Uncle Monty as he read stories to me. I wish I could have those days back. The library felt strangely odd and eerily silent without him. In fact, the only thing I could hear was the sound of the storm outside. I seated myself in a cozy chair, hoping it would somehow encourage my brain cells to think more clearly about the mystery. In some way, I suppose I did, for on my elbow on the side table I noticed an old newspaper. It was dated back a few months ago, and I turned, and it was turned to the gossip column. I scanned the articles looking for anything that stood out. One article was lightly circled in pencil. It said, 
Rumor has it that the opulent lifestyle of one of France's most well-known families is about to change. The Dorians are in dire straits after a bad investment left them practically selling off furniture to pay back bad debts. The dashing oldest son, Lord Grayson, has left the country for England. Could he be hoping to better his fortunes there, or simply escape the family shame? Oh my, oh my. And as much as I'd like to say this news came as a shock, I'd have to admit that it wasn't. I knew I'd heard Grayson's name before, maybe in tabloids like this one. The news of his family's loss of fortune had circulated all over Europe, so I finally understood why the name Dorian rang a bell. As it turned out, Grayson was no better than me. A man with a title, but no fortune. I sat for perhaps another moment or two in deep contemplation before the thought struck me. Grayson was penniless, according to the paper. He had also left his home country for no apparent reason. Was he really on the prowl to secure some sort of fortune for himself and his family? Is that why he was here? I knew immediately that I had to talk to him about it. I stood up, grabbed the newspaper, and hurried downstairs to the dining room. But when I arrived, it was empty. Even the food had been cleared away. I started to roam the expansive mansion looking for the others. Finally, I, loco I located them in the parlor where they'd been retiring after dinner. Ah, Lady Strawberry, you have returned to us. I trust that you find yourself refreshed? I am, thank you. If I return with a burning question, can you tell me more about this article in the newspaper? It refers to your family and yourself. Does it not? Ugh. This old tabloid. Yes, I had heard this story was circulating here. It's quite true, even if it's in a cheap tabloid such as this one. Actually, this article is kinder than we deserve. It says my family lost its wealth because of bad investments. That is somewhat true, but my father's a betting man. He lost most of his fortune to his gambling addiction and inability to pay back his debts. After our fortune was squandered, I had no choice but to strike out on my own and make my own way in the world. At this point, I was faced with a choice. It's totally choice time, everybody. Choice time. So, should we accept that or ask? Ah, let's accept it. I decided to take Sir Grayson at his word rather than, you know, accuse him of murder. Since he confessed to his family's poor financial situation and seemed quite transparent about it, I decided not to question him further. I didn't want to embarrass him, and I felt myself believing his words. His story seemed genuine to me. Sir, I believe you have left out some vital pieces of information. I'm a man of the world. Before settling down in this neighborhood, I did some traveling. Spent a little time in France, in fact, very recently. I must say, Grayson, the name is Dorian, the family name of Dorian's all over the country. So I heard some of your story. There's one man in particular who swindled your father out of every penny he owned. His name is Sir Frederick. Dastardly man, by all accounts, I must say. So, you took it into your head, you must avenge your family's honor. You confronted Frederick and challenged him to a duel. And the duel got heated, more heated, I think, than even you expected. Yes, things got out of hand and the duel turned into a fight. A long, bloody fight. Sir Frederick nearly lost his life. You stopped before actually killing him, of course, but... <laughs> stop! <clears throat> For the love of God, stop! I don't want to hear my own story echoed back at me. I know the entire tale. Then please, finish it for me. I believe the ladies in the room have the right to hear it. Hmm. Fine. Yes, I nearly killed that scum, Frederick. If I had, there isn't a jury in the world who would have taken his side. He'd already been in hot water for a number of similar crimes. So I've no doubt that everyone would have come to see it my way. Unfortunately, though, Sir Frederick did not die. I didn't have the heart to finish the job. He survived, and he survived to get vengeance against the entire Dorian family. He made our lives a living hell after that. Ugh. Although badly injured, it didn't stop him from spreading the most horrible, vicious rumors about me, my family, and everyone we loved. We tried to talk to him, we tried to restore our good name, since our family fortune was at this point irretrievable. He was unrelenting. 
Finally, I had enough. I left France and never looked back. I was wandering around, just a, a stranger in an unknown land, unsure of where to go, when I heard from Helena. Her letter was a guiding light, giving me the first real piece of hope in, in so long. She was the only person left who cared for me. So you say. Yet we've just learned you killed a man very recently. Or almost nearly. You nearly killed a man. That would prove you're capable of murder. But I didn't kill that man. If anything, that proves I don't kill people. Oh yes, I know. At the very last second you pulled back, restrained yourself. But who's to say the next time someone stood in the way of something you wanted? <laughs> say a large fortune? That you no longer felt compelled to hold yourself back. Especially if that person was a weak, vulnerable female with a large fortune. Sir, enough! Again, I must ask you to stop. 